If you're, uh, if you have a Bible, open it up to First Kings chapter 19. Uh, we are in week two of a series that we're doing on solitude, adventuring away to be alone with God in the quiet. Uh, it's the practice of Jesus that helps us really cultivate. Uh, becoming more like Jesus and life in the Spirit, uh, more specifically for the sake of others. And so last week we talked about uh, kind of the beginning of Elijah's journey into solitude as he found himself uh, dangerously tired from all the work that he had been doing for God and how it had left him in a place where more than anything else he, he needed to get some rest. And today we're going to see what uh, God does and what's on what's on Elijah's mind as he begins to enter into uh, deeper solitude with God in the midst of this cave that he camps out in. And so uh, if you have your Bible, 1 Kings 19 verse 9, uh, so we're going to start reading. It says this, there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Uh, he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left. They seek my life to take it away. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. I, uh, I find it interesting how this really begins, how this journey begins. It says that he uh, as he got to Mount Horeb, he found himself in uh, a cave and lodged in that cave. And one thing that you begin to realize as uh, you read the Bible more and more, uh, you begin to realize that these physical things actually have deep, like, um, like metaphysical or metaphorical uh, ideas behind them. And so there, there's a deeper, more profound meaning about why the cave is so significant in Elijah's story, or at least I think that there is, uh, just to give you some frame of reference. I, I think this cave is legitimate. As I said, he's on Mount Horeb, a uh, place where people have gone to meet with God in the past, and, uh, and, and he is now there to meet with God. And it is significant, though, because a cave is a place of where you find natural safety and security. A cave is a place that you go into and you find uh, a, a safety from the elements of, of outside and all of those kinds of things. It's a place of solitude. There's no one else in the cave. And so he's, he's going into a place of, of solitude and, and aloneness uh, with God. And he moves in um, into, this, into this place um, where, where he... He also finds himself in, in this dark cave, right? It's, it's dark. There's no light uh, the deeper and deeper you go into the cave. And, and so when I read this, I, I see this as like, oh, this is a safe place. Yes, but it's also a very dark place. It's a place of darkness. And I think it really speaks to Elijah and where he's at personally in this story. As he travels and ventures into solitude, he's in a place of needing protection, needing safety, needing to know that he's safe. And so the cave provides that. But it also is this place of darkness, which his life seems to be just overwhelmed by right now. Um, as he has been uh, sought after by, by people for his life to be taken from him. But then there is often a question when we get alone with God and we go to this place of quiet with God and solitude with God, uh, when God comes and, and when we know that we're safe enough, uh, that, that nothing's going to, to happen, and we also feel this insurmountable darkness, there's often a question that comes. And uh, I don't know if God asked this question in order to try and like just get Elijah to tell him what's going on because God doesn't know. I don't think that that's the case, but but just might be. But but I actually I think God asked this question so that Elijah can start to deal with some of the stuff that's in his head. He's he's been thinking about this stuff for the last forty days as he's wandered through the wilderness, going from the broom tree to the cave, and uh, and he asked the question, "What are you doing here?" Now, this is a really significant question when we venture into solitude and time alone with God to ask ourselves, what are we doing here? The question is not, what are you doing here to be with God, right? <laughs> like, like not, not, not that, but, but what got you to this place? What's going on right now? What, what has, has gotten you to this place that you're dealing with whatever you're dealing with? Maybe it's dark things. Maybe it's things that seem hard to overcome. Do you feel safe enough? 
with God to tell him what's really on your mind. And what we see is that Elijah is more than willing to say what's been on his mind and what he's been thinking for the last 40 days. And, uh, and as his mind has been racing this whole time, he shares it all. He shares the good, the bad, and the ugly. All right, the good is this. The good is, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. See, the good news is, is that Elijah has been extremely faithful. He's been really faithful. He's worked hard. He's done good work. He's shown himself to be loyal, willing to stand on the promises and on the hope of God and let nothing else come between him and God. He desires him above all else. If only we all could say that, right? Like if we all put ourselves in this, could we say this? That we've been faithful to this, like in this manner and in this way? So, I know for you, maybe, maybe you can, but for me, I, 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 I don't think I can a lot of the time. It'd be a pretty difficult statement for me to speak of uh, myself in this way a lot of the time. But, but there is good to report here on Elijah's behalf. He's, he's got something good to say. He's got a good part of the report, but he's also got the bad. Here's the bad. The bad is the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. It's pretty bad. Right? We can all kind of agree, like, oh, that's, that, that's, that's pretty bad. The people have been the opposite of Elijah. They've, been, uh, they've rejected God. They've rejected his covenant. They've rejected his promises. They've, they've turned away from him again and again. They've killed his companions. They've killed his colleagues. He's all by himself, which is where things get really, really ugly. He's saying to God, like, like, it's really bad down here. God, I don't know if you see it. I don't know if you're doing anything about it, but I don't think you are. These people that you've sent me to try and reach are the worst. He kind of sounds like Jonah in, in that sense, right? It's just, it's just not getting better. It's just getting uglier. And here's the ugly. Uh, I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Elijah is all alone. He's feeling helpless. He's afraid because he has no one left to confide in or no one left to be with him. He has no one, no companion, no community. And if anyone could find him, at least the people who are actually looking for him, they would kill him. So now you can probably see why he was ready to call it quits last week, right? I mean, think about it. He's all alone. It's a terrible way to live. And some of us know what that's like far too well. Some of us have been living life of, lives of loneliness for a long time, but also everyone's mad at him. Everyone's angry with him. Everyone wants him dead. So for him to stay alive means to live in isolation. Uh, to be around others means making them upset or potentially losing his life. I would want to quit too, right? Like anybody else feel that way? That's the way Elijah is feeling. He's like, what's the point? What's the point? You see how this good, this bad, this ugly have been racing through his mind and been on his mind for some time. And this is all that he's been wrestling with. Does your mind ever race like that? Does it ever go to like, oh, here's the, here's the good, here's the bad, and here's the ugly. And, and most of the time it's just the bad and the ugly that your mind sends, tends to dwell on. And you're just, your mind just won't stop. It just races and races and races. You ever feel yourself talking to God and trying to defend your faithfulness? Not understanding, like, hey, God, like, you don't understand how faithful I've been. How did my life get in such a dark place? Thinking of God and saying to God, God, I'm down here and I'm trying really, really hard. Like, what, what is going on? You ever feel like you just can't see, um, you just, you, like, the, the God just can't see how good you've been or how hard you've worked or how you've remained faithful in a world that's faithless. You ever feel that way? You ever feel alone in your pursuit to follow God and do his will? Do you ever feel like, like everyone else has fallen away? That, that everyone else is falling away or everyone else will eventually fall away? And it's hopeless. It's hopeless to try and reach your spouse or your kids or your neighbors or your coworkers. You ever feel like the difference that you're trying to make is just making things more and more difficult and more and more dark and more and more frustrating? You ever feel alone? You ever feel like, man, no one is here to talk to or confide in. There's no one who understands me. There's no one who understands what I'm going through. You ever feel like there's never anyone there when you need them? 
this is what Elijah's dealing with. Now, I know many of you don't have the same issues as Elijah, so they might not be, the, the good, bad, ugly might look different, but I think like Elijah, we can all probably say there is some good, there's some bad, and there's some ugly. And when we go to God and, and we enter into solitude with God, that's where we should start. We should start with the good, the bad, and the ugly. Just start with those things. Begin to wrestle with those things. That is what has gotten you here. Now, solitude is not counseling. Can I just be honest? Like counseling is like there for you to go and get help to try and fix the things that need to be fixed in your life. Solitude doesn't really do that. Uh, but, but what solitude does is it helps us venture into deeper places with God where, uh, where he can speak in a profound way in the midst of it without fixing it, and we can be content with that. We can become content with that. But if you venture into solitude thinking that God's going to just fix all your problems immediately, you're going to be pretty disappointed. So don't, don't, let's, not, let's not chalk this up to like, I'm going to go and talk to God like I would talk to a counselor, and he's just going to give me a bunch of advice to fix the problems that I'm having. That's not what God does in solitude. Solitude is about coming to God with what is, not what should be or what could be or what we think should be because we've been good or because we've been faithful or anything else like that. It's about being with God in what is, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right now in this place. So start with that, and you might be surprised what God does. God does some really cool things. What he does with Elijah is he calls Elijah to stand before him and have a talk. Now, if you get called by God to have a talk, there are many different things that could run through your mind, right? Like if you think of God as, a, as an angry father, you might, you might honestly be afraid to walk out into the presence of God. Uh, you, you, you might be afraid to walk into his presence thinking he's going to just give it to you, right? Um, and, and far too often, because that's been our experience with our earthly fathers, that's the, that's the image we project on our heavenly father. If you grew up with, with, the, with a father who was maybe passive, in some way, or pretty passive when it came to conflict. Um, you, may, you may be frustrated because you feel like you're going to go into the presence of God and God's not going to say anything and he's not going to do anything and he's just going to be passive the whole time. You may, have grow, like, you may think of God as like this king, which means you have to clean yourself up in order to enter his presence. And you have to find and do all the right things in order to not displease him. No matter your view, the, the idea of being called into the presence of God is pretty intimidating, isn't it? And, and, but God calls Elijah out of the cave, and this is significant, again, because if you think about what the cave represents and what it signifies is this place of darkness and it's this place of hiding. And God is calling Elijah into the light. He's calling him out of the darkness. He says, I'm not, I, don't, I don't dwell in the darkness, so come, Speak with me in the light. And so Elijah comes out of the cave, but it is a really, really scary moment. It's a really scary moment. Look at verse 11. It says, And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke into pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Now, before we go too deep into what is happening here, we should look at the Bible and ask ourselves some pretty uh, important questions. Like, have you ever seen wind tear rocks apart? No, you haven't, okay? I'll just answer the question for you. You haven't. You haven't seen wind do that. Um, and so, so does that happen here or does that not happen here, right? That, 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 is, a, that is something you can ask. Um, maybe, right? Maybe. I don't think that that's necessarily what matters, right? Because um, even uh, the wind and the fire and the earthquake are not necessarily uh, literal um, in their interpretation, but they explain something very significant about Elijah and how he is feeling. And they exhibit the power of God in a mighty way. But, but they don't always exhibit the overall character of God. And so these things it describe something, I think, that is going on internally with Elijah, the struggle that he's dealing with. He seems like his life is falling apart, that, he, that, he, that his life really 
seems like it's, it's shaken and it's unsturdy, that it's burning to the crown, for lack of a better term. You get this idea? Now, what he's experiencing is, is chaos. It's chaos. And God isn't in any of it. He isn't in the wind. He isn't in the earthquake. He isn't in the fire. Where do you find God? Where, where does God show up as Elijah emerges from this darkness to be with him? We'll look at verse 12. It says, After the wind, or after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? See, God is not found in these loud and chaotic things, but instead he speaks in this gentle whisper. And the question is the same as before, which makes me think the question is not so, like what God asks Elijah is not so much what is important here, but how God asks it is what God is trying to drive home. That he he asks it in this gentle, compassionate, loving way. Now his mind, again, hasn't stopped racing since that letter from Jezebel and those messengers came bring that, that really scary message to him. It's just been chaotic and scary and life feels like it's falling apart and shaking uncontrollably, burning to the ground. And yet Elijah comes into the light to meet God and his gentle whisper offers Elijah a clear picture of God's character. And think about how God has already shown up in this story, right? If you look back to last week, how did God show up for Elijah? What did he do for him? He offered him rest. He offered him food. He, he, just, he just was gentle with Elijah. He didn't ream him for running for his life. He didn't get angry with him. He didn't yell and scream. He didn't, he didn't say, you need to get back out there and keep going. He, he, he gave him what he needed most, and he met him in a gentle and kind way. So why would we think that God would show up in any other way than that? He shows up in this very gentle and kind way to Elijah. And Elijah has gone to meet with God in the mess of all of it. And God has chosen to meet with him and express this kindness and gentleness to him. The truth is here that when we take time, when you and I take time to venture to be with God, um, we begin to see more clearly, not just the good, the bad, and the ugly in our life, but we get to see more clearly the character of God. We get to see more clearly his character and how it shines into the darkest places that we're dealing with, the darkest things that we're going through. And it offers us the ability to have peace of mind. It gives us a blessed assurance that our God is with us in the most chaotic places, even though he's not the most chaotic things. Does that make sense? So he's not the chaotic things, but he's with us in the chaotic stuff because the chaos does not pose a threat to him. Now, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, will we venture into solitude? Will we venture in to be with God and be still long enough to hear that gentle voice, that gentle whisper? What are you doing here? But we give him honestly the good, the bad, and the ugly when he asks us that question. And will we let his character be revealed when he calls us out, no matter what we think of him? Will we, will we, will we just listen and see what, what presents itself about who he is and the character of who he is? Yeah, there's a great quote that um, I always forget who it's from and so forgive me for not knowing who it's from but um but I love it and it really has helped me and so I don't really care where it's from because it's helped me uh a lot as I've ventured into solitude and um and it and it goes like this if you find your mind racing as you venture into solitude and your mind moves off of focus from God to a thousand other things every minute that's a thousand opportunities every minute to return to a God that's still there. When I sit down every morning in my office, I light a candle to just symbolize that the presence of God is with me. And then I just, 
settle into a comfortable position and uh, and I get silent uh, with God. And when I do, my mind races. It just races. It just goes all over the place. This morning, it was about softball practice this afternoon and um, and just all kinds of other things and other projects that you're working on or other things that you need to accomplish or get done or the massive amount of things that I forgot to do before standing up here to preach this sermon or what, whatever, right? Just, just erases from one thing to another. And every time I, I come to this realization that my mind has wandered off of focus on God, um, I just see it as an opportunity to refocus my attention back on him because of that quote. That quote really helps me with that. And so I hope that maybe that will be encouraging to you as well as you venture into solitude. But if we will rest long enough, which I hopefully you have by now, because last week that was the next step, right? You were just supposed to sleep a lot. Uh, and uh, so that you, you could be still and quiet long enough to, to be in the quiet place with God. And when you get there, your mind is still going to be racing and it's going to be hard to focus on him. But yet he'll still whisper if you can just focus. And so always come back, always come back. And he'll ask you, what are you doing here? And we'll have endless opportunities to sit with that question and begin to work through that with God, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And he will never leave us. He will never leave us. Now, here's the only thing you can do wrong in solitude. Are you ready? Only thing you can do wrong in solitude is leave. The only thing you can do in, wrong in solitude is, is leave. It's to give up on it. To quit. That doesn't mean like at the end of five minutes or 10 minutes or however long you set aside to be alone with God, that you don't get up and go do what you need to do. That just means that you keep coming back again and again and again. That you don't leave and become unfaithful to the practice of getting in to the quiet. And so the only thing you could do wrong is, is to leave and say, no, I don't, I'm not going to ever be alone with you, God. I'm not going to ever venture into that quiet place. That's all you can do wrong. You can use the quiet place to pray. Uh, that's a great thing to do. Maybe you have a journal and you just begin to write. Maybe you spend time in the Word and let God speak through His Word in the quiet place. There, there's no, literally, there's nothing wrong that you can do except get up and leave and never come back. That's it. That's it. So, what do you say? Are you guys feeling rested enough? You got some sleep? You guys feeling good? You ready to venture into what God has for us next with what is? Like, hey, God, here it is. This is what is. If so, I want to challenge you to something called the daily office. Now, the daily office is just the term that we use to describe this process, but, um, but it's pretty simple. The daily office, uh, you can do this a number of different ways. Like I said before, one of the things that I do is I, I come in and I light a candle uh, in the morning just to signify the presence of God, and then I sit in silence. So the idea is to find a comfortable place in your house, in your office, uh, in the quiet. Uh, and just sit in a comfortable position. Uh, not too comfortable that you'll fall asleep, but a comfortable position. Uh, so usually the best position, I think, is to sit with your back straight, feet on the floor, hands open on your lap to just kind of say, God, I'm here, right? Um, and if you sit in that kind of posture, you likely won't fall asleep in that kind of posture, but you'll uh, stay more attentive um, when you get to this uh, place and you get still and you get quiet, just say a simple prayer. Uh, it doesn't have to be a long prayer. It doesn't have to be elaborate. It could, it, like, for, for me, the prayer I always pray is, come Holy Spirit. Amen. Right? And that's all I do. I just pray, come Holy Spirit. And then I just sit in silence. But yours could be, Lord, have mercy. Or, Jesus, I've come to be with you. Would you come and meet with me? Like, whatever you might, like, want your prayer to be, just pray that prayer. It's just a really simple thing. Then just close your eyes and be still and be silent. And every time your mind wanders or races or, or moves off focus, just go back to that prayer. Go back to whatever the prayer is that you said, hey, this is what is going to bring my attention back to God. This is what's going to bring my focus back on him instead of the million other things running through my mind. And then, um, and then last, I would just say like, hey, like uh, end with a prayer of gratitude. They just end with a prayer of gratitude that God has been with you, that he's met with you, and that, that, um, that he's been with you the whole time and the good and the bad and the ugly. And um, hopefully, hopefully it will, 
it will uh, just cultivate something great in you. Here's the, the challenge this week is to do this for five minutes, okay, every day in the morning and in the evening. Um, I typically uh, will, will spend about 15 to 20 minutes in, in silence like this uh, at the beginning of my day. Uh, but I've been doing this for years, okay? Uh, and so I, I wouldn't suggest that you start with like the longest amount of time possible. You feel start to feel comfortable. You feel like five minutes isn't enough, then increase it, right? Go up. But, but I would say if you could start with five minutes and just sit in silence and be with God with what is, the good, the bad, and the ugly for five minutes, um, in the morning and at night, you'd, you'd be well on your way, well on your way. All right. So, um, so let's just, let's just start there. Okay. Let's just start there this week and, uh, hopefully it will begin to bless you, um, as you, as you venture into that with God. Um, like I said, last week, we are doing the solitude practice in our life group. So if you're not a part of that, um, you could always join a life group or be a part of that through, uh, with, with a group of people. Um, that's really, really neat to talk about our experiences in solitude with others um, and, uh, and that, that sort of thing. One thing I will say, and forgot to mention this to our first, first service, uh, but, but next week when you come in, uh, we're going to ask that you enter in silence. Uh, so there's not going to be any loud music playing over the speakers or anything else like that. Uh, and we're just going to ask that you come in and take a seat and sit in silence until we get started. We'll call, uh, we'll make a call to worship uh, uh, and, and invite you to, to enter and, and um, leave that period of silence. But we want you to come in here after spending time in silence with God this week and just be silent uh, with him before we start to worship next week too. There'll be signs and, and stuff at the door to remind you to enter with silence next week. But um, hopefully that won't intimidate you too much and you won't all just come late, right? Like hopefully, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll, you'll be here early to enjoy that time of silence, actually. Uh, if, that, if that gives you some fear, right? If you feel some angst or some anxiety about, oh, I'm just going to come in and sit in a room in silence or I'm going to sit in silence at home. Be with God with that. Like if, that, if that's how you feel, like it's okay. Let God know that this is uncomfortable for you. That's okay. All right. That's all right. Let's pray. God, thank you for um, just the chance for us to be with you this morning, for you to speak to us in a powerful and mighty way. God, I just, I pray that you would would just captivate our hearts and our minds. Focus them on you and your goodness. And no matter the good, the bad, or the ugly, God, may we know that you, you take it all. You receive it all. And whatever has brought us to wherever we are right now in life is not as important as walking through it with you and knowing that you are with us in the midst of it. And so God, I just pray that we might take time to be still and know that you are with us right now and every day, wherever we're at. And so, God, we're just going to take a moment. I'm going to be quiet. And we're just going to sit with you. With what is. So come, Holy Spirit.